Get ready for Sewing with Creativity. Welcome to my new three-part series on patterns with vision, where you'll learn unique skills and refreshing design ideas. Diane Erickson is the inspiration for this series. She's a designer of the Java jacket pattern and many other designs. Diane, you're a master at working with fabrics and patterns. I'm so glad to have you with us during this series. I see the pattern as a blank canvas that lets me attach my sewing techniques and my design skills to each garment in a totally unique way. For instance, on our first design, the Java jacket, this garment has the perfect shapes for piecing and adding fun with decorative details and style. I'll show you how to select fabric combinations and placement to flatter different figure types. But first, Nancy, will you detail the creative sewing steps included in my turning as you go lining technique? I'll be glad to. So stay tuned for the joy of sewing next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, celebrating 20 years of Sewing with Nancy Zeman is brought to you by Pfaff, the largest European producer of sewing machines. Pfaff's creative line of sewing machines and hobby lock sergers are simply the best. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears for home, classroom, and industry. Ginger scissors and shears are the choice of professionals. Madeira, superior quality threads from Germany, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads, because creativity is never black and white. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions, including products by Dritz, Collins, and Omnigrid. Amazing designs by Great Notions, your one source for home embroidery and design software. Over 200 disc pack collections currently available, including designs by Nancy Zeman. Koala cabinets from Australia, quality crafted, fully assembled sewing furniture, designed for maximum storage in minimum space. Rowanta, professional performance and beautiful results for all types of ironing, the choice of professionals and Nancy's Notions Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and unique hard-to-find sewing notions and supplies. I always like to show you new ways of sewing, and the way to construct the Java jacket where you line as you go is really unique and relatively new. I'd like to show you the front pieces that are going to be sewn together, upper front jacket, lower front, and then there's a simple little facing that has just been sewn together along the outer edges. These three pieces are sewn together along the crosswise seam, and I'm just going to kind of fold them like this so you can see how they would be stitched together. Simple seaming. All straight stitch is what we're going to work with in this program to initially put the jacket together. It's line as you go and the lower part of the jacket is attached to the front, just the front piece, and we're going to sew this lower curve as you can see marked at the, along the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance, stopping at the, the notch or the clip marks. When this jacket is turned, the lower portion is turned right side out. This is what it looks like. It looks like we have the lower portion a little heavier weight and you can see that the, the bottom jacket now is fully lined. To get the po top portion of the jacket lined, all we are going to do is simply meet, after putting in the little tuck for the dart, the upper portion of the lining for the jacket and restitch the seam. Then you're going to do a lot of trimming and grading of the seam allowances and pressing. So the whole jacket front now is lined all at once really quick. This piece shows that how the lining has been complete and we're going to flip this to the wrong side to add the placket. We're going to add the buttons, button areas before we even add the jacket back. As I said, a really great construction idea. I've marked about an inch and a half from the cut edge of the jacket and then using the facing piece for the front placket, we'll simply align it along that inch and a half mark and stitch a presser foot width away. When I turn this to the right side, you'll find out that, or you'll see how the facing, this placket piece will cover the front area of the jacket, covering all these outer edges. As an artist, Diane has taken a very creative way of working with pattern construction. The side that's going to have the buttons, and the button, or the button loops, I should say, is what's done next putting these button loops on before you even have a shoulder seam stitched. The button loops have been turned and stitched to that facing section. And to cover that raw seam, about an inch and a fourth strip has been sewn or it has been pressed using wrong sides together and then sewn along this raw edge and then flipped. That was fast. We have the placket, the buttonhole, 
all the front complete with just a lot of straight stitching and unique construction orders. Let's take a look at the jacket to see the next portion because we've worked in this area of the jacket, lining it, but for the back we're going to do the same thing. You can have a portion of the lining showing at the center back and that is by kind of fudging that lining piece which I'll show you right now. This is an optional treatment, but we're going to work with this technique throughout the series of this little fudge of the stitching techniques. When meeting the bright sides together of the jacket back, offset the lining so that you're only sewing about a fourth of an inch on the lining. You don't have the right sides together. When you turn this piece to the right side, you'll see that you'll have this little extra fudge of the lining showing, like a little extra trim. You may have to kind of adjust somewhat the shoulder seams and the raw edges, but you can just see this nice little extra trim before turning right side out, so the lower edge of both pieces. You're going to have two back units complete. The center back seam of each is complete. Either you can have it, the fabrics meeting on a one-to-one -one ratio, or you can fudge the seam as we have on this side. And Diane has designed a little interesting flap that you can put in the seam. But then to sew the center back seam, simply overlap the pieces, the right half on top of the left half, or vice versa, and then top stitch the two together. Really an amazing way of working with this. You'll check on this piece that's finished. We've stitched along the lower edge, and of course, to the clip mark at the center at the side seam, just the way we worked with the front pieces. Now, we're going to put the front and the back together. This is what is such a great way of working with it. We simply meet the front piece to one side of the back, to the right side of the back, sew the seam. The rest is just overlapped and hand stitched. The shoulder seam is sewn in the same way. You would have your fronts and backs sewn together and now it's time for the sleeve. In this jacket, the beauty is in the details, and there are many details throughout this pattern, including a finish of binding around the neckline and the armhole. I'd like to point those out right now. On my sample, which is just a jacket half, you'd have a whole jacket right at this point, a front, two fronts and two backs, but you'd be adding binding around the neckline and also the underarm area. Let's reference the finished jacket so that you can see where that's accomplished using the fabric of your choice, using your favorite binding technique, and that's detailed in the instructions that accompany this program. Add the binding around the armhole and the underarm. And the reason we need the binding around the underarm is that the underarm is, has an opening. It's a very unique design, very comfortable to wear. Later on, we'll also be adding that binding to the under opening of the sleeve. Let's take a little look at this sleeve. It's a unique style very stylized. When you see the seam, it's at the back. And there's a bias seam in this area, a straight edge seam here. And, and Diane has, in her pattern design, added a unique trim, or just an accent trim through this area. I'll show you how to create the sleeve. It again is a line-as-you-go sleeve. The pattern piece is not an unusual sleeve. It doesn't look at all like it has a cap because it doesn't. It's a, it's a fun sleeve. It has a shoulder. It has an underarm area. And when you add a trim, you add it to the straight of grain area, the, the part that doesn't have any stretch. And just a little trim is placed in this area and I'll fold it at the shoulder and I'll fold up the underarm so that you can see how this would be sewn. And you'd be sewing from the clip marks to the underarm area or to where my hands are positioning between the clip marks. The piece underneath features a stripe fabric and it shows the bias area of the underarm. So you can see what a unique look you could achieve with a different choice of fabrics. So both the lining unit and the outer sleeve unit together at that side seam. And here on our sleeve itself you can see that little trim or piping coming out then stuff right sides together, or meet right sides together. I think meet would be a better word than stuff, but here we'll just put these two fabric pieces together, and we're going to be matching the lower edges. Right sides meeting, matching the lower edges, and you're going to sew according to the guide sheet, matching the cut edges and sewing the cuff areas. So we'll be sewing along the cuff following the instructions. 
When you turn this right side out, your sleeve is lined and almost finished. We can see in the sample we have added the piping along this lower edge around that opening that we showed you before. Now here's the sample front. And to do this, this final stitching, you'll find that you'll need to mark from the pattern itself. There are many markings in the pattern that are great to transfer right to your fabric. This is going to be the sleeve seam, believe it or not. If you've had difficulty putting sleeves into place, this will not be that one because of the easy straight stitching. You'll meet right sides together, aligning the sleeve to the marking on the fabric. And as I pin instead of stitch, do one more pin. You can see you'd be sewing all the way around, but let me just flip this out and you can see your sleeve has been added. And now we'll show you some very creative touches to this pattern. I just gave you the step-by-step -step details of working with the Java jacket, but now the fun starts. Now the creativity of choosing fabrics. I just worked with basic denim, Diane, but you're going to show us different fabric combinations. Well, let's look at some ways you can get some design ideas to make your jacket a little more personal. Um, one of the things I start with is I Xerox the pattern envelope uh, front and back, and then I just place my tracing paper over the top so I can trace my own little uh, garment to draw on and this gives you an opportunity to do color so you can see I've d taken those little tracings and I've colored in different combinations which lets me play with maybe fabrics that I have at home then I also have a design card here where I've glued different things that I like that are in interesting colors together even a piece of birch bark and some hmm. ribbon onto this card and then I'm going to do a fabric combination from that card this would be a great Java jacket. Yes. So I could use these colors and to actually see this as a jacket, look what happens when you actually cut those fabrics up and glue them down to a piece of paper. So these are actual pieces of fabric mm -hmm. that give me a feel for what my jacket could really look like. You've done some interpretation of this color combination. This, yeah, this blue and white color combination. These are all cutouts from magazines here. This is the Java jumper. And you can see by, as you look at the jumper, um, I've taken this as my cue, this card is my start, and I've made knot buttons out of the, the fabrics. Mm -hmm. I've combined traditional Japanese fabrics with contemporary fabrics, some batiks and some solids. It's a great, as great as a jumper. So there's no limitation to what you can do with the pattern. And all you did was lengthen the front and back pattern pieces. All I did was lengthen the front and back pattern piece. The garment we have on the dress form is uh, shows some more variations mm -hmm. on color combinations and shapes that you can use. I've uh, stenciled the, the fabric in the front, and then I've taken some cues from some of the shapes to reshape some of the edges on the pattern. So you can see as you look at the pocket and the top edge of the flap, I'm kind of tailoring those details to go with um, some of the shapes in the pattern. I've also done that on the back of the sleeve where I've got a little tab mm -hmm. and, and that extra button. And I'm really liking being able to shape yes. some of those details because those are design edges. Those aren't fitting edges. Yes. So you can play with those. Now, we, I didn't show how to make the pocket. And this is, has a little design detail, as you mentioned, the top. But let's show our viewers how to go about making the pocket. Let me show you the pocket. It is so easy to construct. So here's the basic, here's the basic pocket shape. Um, here's one that's got a little bit of a different uh, design on the edge. But to actually construct that pocket, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking the front of the pocket and taking a lining for the front of the pocket. I've got a little piping in that top edge there. You can see that gray. So I'm finishing that top edge of the pocket first. Then I'm laying the top pocket onto the back of the pocket, which will be the part you see at the top here. Then you just simply put your lining on top. And if you want, you can base this down first so sure. that you have a stitching line on the back to follow. So you put your lining right on top. So now you have like a little pillow with the front inside. Mm -hmm. Now you're simply going to stitch all the way down and up and around, clip all the curves, turn and press and pull your pocket through the top and then finish the top with the buttonholes and, and folding the top edge down. So it's a real easy pocket to construct with lots of variations uh, possible. It's a detachable pocket and you've used about five or six different fabrics in here piecing. Totally different not uh, just fabric one combination. Fabric. <laughs> and why not make three or four different sets of pockets sure. for the same jacket, which is really uh, fun to, now, to do. Viewers may wonder why we're calling us what we're wear the jackets we're wearing, vests we're wearing, Java. Well, the Java jacket has two really great coffee cup pockets in it, which were very fun to construct and, and figure <laughs> out. And they make a great little jumper bag or a pocket to attach to your, to your garment.
Let me show you some other ways that you yes. can come up with some pocket designs. Um, this is the shape of the pocket. And what I've done is I've taken and cut out this shape because I'm going to show you some magic here. That's a pretty great way to come up with a pocket design. I have these little pieces of fabric that I've just lined and turned and interesting shapes and edges and I've got a piece I might use for the back. So I can lay these pieces down and get ideas just by, I can show myself exactly mm -hmm. what my pocket would look like. Pretty fun to see yes. the finished thing without actually having cut the fabric. Now look what happens if I decide I want to add an extra flap. I can continue to see the finished pocket and maybe what I'm ending up with here now is two pockets instead sure. of one. But it's really magic to be able to show yourself what you could get. So I have a, a combination of these pieces and you can see there's a there's another shape right there that could be used. Fun. To, to show you the pocket. And I've made, I always make the windows in different shapes. So you can see here we've got We've got several different shape windows and we could change that from the pattern piece. Here's a piece that's ready to go. You might actually be constructing a piece a little bigger than what you think you need mm -hmm. just to be able to put that same window on there. And I never get tired of doing this. I love this technique because do you see how it gives you the option yes. of how much you're going to see of the different colors mm -hmm. and the angle at the front? So it really lets you personalize what that detail is going to look like. Once you have what you want in the window, mm -hmm. you want this piece. And you want to lay that back in. You want to take the window away. And then you add your seam allowance around the outside. And then you construct it as we showed with that original piece with the black uh, back. So it's real easy and you can see what you're going to get. So everybody can do it and really enjoy the technique. I really like that. We showed you on the mauve jacket that the facing itself had some interesting detail changes, not the traditional shapes that we worked with earlier. Diane, you have some, some shapes there. Let me just first of all get this pattern piece, the original pattern piece we had. So uh, what we've got here is a, it are examples of different ways of finishing the edges so that you can have a little showing, a lot showing, and it's really determined by the direction you're pressing the seam allowance. So you're going to want to play with that and really mm -hmm. give yourself an opportunity to use that lining fabric as part of your design. And we've done that here on the uh, flap for the pocket just by getting a little bit of that color to peek through. So here's the original pattern piece. You can see along that edge we've got a little bit of that green showing and on this blue and a little bit of the gray showing. Now all we're doing is cutting that pattern, the lining piece, just slightly bigger. Yeah, a quarter of an inch or so. And you could also cut on the bias. Absolutely, absolutely. On the bias, it will give you more opportunity to curve that piece in different directions. And if you decide to do a shape, as we've done here, you'll see we've got a really fun thing going on with the, the shape of this, uh, this piece. So if we decide we want to have the shape, and you can see I've cut the lining, which is the black piece, a little larger than, than the, uh, the outside of the flap, so I'm going to get some extra fabric out of that. The secret here is to do a little um, basting stitch mm -hmm. first, just to get yourself a little poof in the fabric. Sure. And you can see it's drawn up a little bit. That's my stitching line. When I put these together, right sides together, I want to be sewing from this top piece and leaving the full part on the bottom sure. of the machine. I want to be stitching that up so that when I finish sewing that piece, what I have is this little poof here. So I can turn it, and as I bring my iron over to do a little bit of pressing, it's going to be really easy to get a little bit of that showing. Diane, let's which show gives our, me that shape. Yes, great. Let's show our viewers that kind of shape, not exact shape, but that unique shape at the at the edge. Same idea. And you've mirrored it also onto the pocket. Yeah. What a wonderful way of combining design, color, and fabric. Hi, Nancy. I'm Sue Chandler from Buckley, Illinois, and I want to congratulate you on your 20th year. It's been wonderful. I enjoy seeing you on TV. Keep up the good work. Thanks. When creating by sewing, you're only limited by your imagination. You can certainly work with many different color combinations, as Diane suggested, and then choosing fabrics that meet those color combinations. This would make a wonderful selection for your Java jacket. Give it a try. Here's a hint from Amazing Designs by Great Notions. Sometimes a garment requires subtle embroidery due to the fabric weight or the delicate garment style, like this cotton piquet shell. Amazing Designs suggest looking at embroidery designs with a new eye. Look to see if you can eliminate some colors or elements to get a completely different look. The flowers on this shell are from the Amazing Designs Floral Collection No. 5, where they are shown in very large, vibrant flowers. By eliminating all the color except the outline, you have a look that's just right for this garment. 
Here's a look at Rowenta's steam generator, an iron I use in my home and at the studio. The steam generator features a lightweight iron and a 33 ounce water tank for steam on demand. Continuous steam is available at a touch of a button, generating twice as much steam as a conventional iron. I use the vertical steam feature for final pressing and when creating home decorating projects. The steam generator's water tank provides up to one and a half hours of steam without refilling. Now you can see why Rowenta is a choice of professionals. At home and at my studio, I sew with Koala cabinets because of their perfect design. There's no waste of time in getting started. Because of the Koala soft touch airlift system, the machine quickly and gently raises to the perfect sewing position. The design allows me to sit directly in front of the needle in clear view of my work with no strain on my neck or back. And Koala has a place for all my favorite notions and supplies. I always feel more efficient and more motivated to do my best work when my space is organized. A perfect design, that's why I sew with Koala. Here's a hint from Ginger. When you're doing machine embroidery or cut work, it's sometimes a challenge to trim threads and fabric from the hoop fabric. I keep my curved embroidery scissors close by for just those occasions. The curved blade cleanly cuts threads close to my work without cutting my stitching. And the slender blades allow me to cut right next to my straight stitch cut work design. Another terrific use of the curved embroidery scissors is to trim closely to scallop stitching. This is a very versatile scissors. Patterns with Vision, the topic of our current three-part series, is your passport to an exciting sewing journey. Diane Erickson, designer of all the patterns we're using in this series, including the peony pattern, is my guest. Diane, you've taught me to look at a pattern from a different perspective, not from a construction process, but from a creative experience. When I sew, I like to add details to the garments and expand on the original idea. The pattern we're going to play with today in this program is my peony top. Like the spring flower, the design lines have curves and shapes that unfold and layer. Nancy, I'll ask you to detail the sewing sequence, and then I'll share fitting and design options that expand the design possibilities. Discover the joy of creative sewing next on Sewing with Nancy. As you know, we're working with designer Diane Erickson through this series, and I'm going to show you one of her patterns, how uniquely it's constructed, it's fun to put together, and then she will join me again to show some unique design or embellishment ideas. Let's take a look at this pattern that she calls peony because it has graceful folds. It can button left over right or right over left. We're going to complete the front and the back and then complete the sleeves and then add the two units together. There's great detail in this garment as you can see along the front. A little bit of the lining or the facing is sneaking through to the right side. The same thing occurs in these unique sleeves. Here's the seam, but the sleeve and the side is one unit, and it opens at the top with graceful folds, and you can close it with a unique button closure, one or two, the choice is yours. It's almost all straight stitching, but the construction is so unique that I'd like to take a little time to show you how it goes together. It's an asymmetrical design, as I mentioned, where we have the back piece, or excuse me, the front piece, one of the front pieces has a straight edge. The other front piece has the curved edge that is going to overlap onto the straight edge. Nice asymmetrical design. You're going to be cutting two pieces from each pattern, one for the lining, one for the outer fabric. In this instance, I like to choose something for the lining that has some style because we may want to have part of the lining show on the right side. I've stitched the front pieces together with right sides meeting, stitching along from the notch. There's a little notch in the pattern all the way to the lower edge. Notice the grading. The grading I simply did with the pinking shears, making one layer larger than the other. When turning this to the right side, turning the layers, generally in a pattern, we would request that we have a nice sharp edge, that we would roll the fabric so that we would have the seam line right on the very edge. Well, in this instance, what would work out as an alternative is just to cheat that a little bit, having the lining, this kind of striped fabric, appear on the right side. Now, you may think, well, your fabrics are not going to match perfectly. You're right, they're not. But you can adjust for that as you're sewing the units together. Using this construction technique, it really works well. So I'm simply going to just kind of press it 
not measuring, just eyeballing about a fourth of an inch around this edge. It looks like piping, but I really do not have piping here. I just have the lining peeking through. If you had a high contrast lining, this would be an excellent little accent. Let me get this folded. And now as I get to the very edge, I'm just going to have it then meet at a one-to-one -one ratio, as you can see. But isn't that a nice edge? The opposite side, you're going to create in the same way, but the shape is totally different. The opposite front, in this instance, the right front, has a straight edge. I'm just sewing it, use a traditional seam allowance. And when this is turned right side out, and later on, this is how the jacket or the top will appear. One area will overlap onto the other. We're going to complete basically the front and back at one time. And here's the back piece. You're just going to put this layer of the back piece on the table to show you the next step with right sides meeting would be to place the fronts to the back matching all the layers at the shoulder seam. Traditional sewing right now, very easy construction techniques. You would pin the layers together at the shoulder seam and then match to that area, if you'd like, a back lining piece. And sew the shoulder seams. It's optional to have a lining piece. And you can set this piece aside for now. Let's look at sleeves again. If we take one more look at our pattern right here, you can see I have two pattern pieces. They're very large. One's for the back front, one's for the side front. And they're going to be sewn together along the underarm seam. This is where I find this is such a unique style. This pattern piece now has been sewn together, these two pattern pieces, along the underarm seam. There's a lining piece that you're going to sew together in the same way on the underarm seam. With right sides together, you're going to meet those two fabrics and sew all this top outer edge. Sew together along the top outer edge. Now I have not shown you in all the step-by-steps here. I'm just showing you the finished piece. Here's the lining portion attached to the garment. I'll straighten away. And you can see it's open at the top. And this later will pin over into a graceful opening. And you can put a button here, closure, unique seam allowance. And as the jacket I'm wearing, it's kind of drapey at the front. So here's this sleeve that has been lined and sewn. And let me put another pin at the top at its overlap. So I have the sleeve unit done. I have the front unit completed. And what I like about this is that I can sew small sections at one time. I'm not working with a lot of fabric at my machine. Here we have another completed front and back section. I think sometimes my life is in samples. And I'm going to open this up a little bit to show you that it's the front and back. And I'm going to now pin these two pieces together, pinning them together, meeting the right sides, pinning the units. And then I'll simply just straight stitch these sections together. We'll refer back in just a few minutes to the completed jacket so that you can see that at, I would sew from the very lower edge all the way around. I have lots of fabric here. It may not be quite as clear. I think this would be clearer to show you on the finished garment. As you recall, I finished the front and the back, attaching them at the shoulders, finished the sleeve and the side units together. Then what I was pinning together are the fabrics from the side and the front, pinning from the side seam all the way around to the back area. One long, long seam. This really goes together in units so that you can sew with not so much fabric at your machine. It works out very well. Now some of the last technique or the last technique really to show you is to work with the collar. And on this small sample, I have the collar partially pinned on. But before I show you the sewing of the collar to the garment, let's look at the collar itself. Many times I like to work with a collar and interface both pattern pieces, both the inner collar and the outer collar, sewing it together along the outer seam, and then doing some grading Grading the seam allowances, because this has such a curve to it, I'd like to use a pinking shears. The pinking shears does the kind of notching plus the trimming at the same time. You're able to grade one layer longer than the other. Turn the collar right side out. 
and then do some pressing along the top edge. And you can see I have a little press mark here I need to get out. The taupe color will be attached to the jacket. And what I'm going to do is just press up, press mark my seam allowance. On the lining, I'm going to totally press under the seam allowance. The whole neckline edge has been pressed. Finding your notches, marking points, match the taupe collar to the outer jacket. Sew the seam. But because now you have already pressed under the collar on the inner edge, you can just overlap the finished seam and do some hand stitching. And these are the basic construction techniques of the peony top. I just finished showing you the very basic and easy construction details of working with the peony pattern. How to assemble it, put it together. But that's just one part of the sewing process. The other part, Diane, is where you shine and that's in all the creative options that you can have on any sewing project. Well, one of the things I love about this pattern is that it's a princess seam, which mm -hmm. gives you so many fitting options and design options at the same time. I want to show you first how to enlarge that dart and make the fit on the front a little more interesting, or any seam for, for that matter. As you look at this one example here, you can see the pieces coming together. There is a dart in that seam. You can see that little green slit there. That's, that's the dart. If we want to go to a larger dart, I want to show you how to do that real easily. So as you look down here on my paper, I've pinned a strip of extra paper to that side piece. And what you want to do is pin this to your body, and I like to hook the front and back together and then pin it along the side of my uh, body to a t-shirt or something so I have it in the right place. And what we're going to do is we're going to have this, lay this along your body and, and mark your bust line because oftentimes this shape is not the shape you need for your bust. So you want to put this pattern piece on and actually draw where your bust line happens um, instead of where the original line is. So what we're going to be doing then is, as we move to this second illustration, you can see that what I've done is I've added where the pink is and I've marked the bust point. And we need two measurements here. We need to be measuring the original line of the pattern piece, standing the tape measure up as you, as you measure, measuring along. Then you need the second measurement, which is the new line. You want to be measuring along the new line that you just created. Now the difference between those two measurements is how much you're going to be adding to this center piece right here. Because the larger you are, the farther out your body goes, the more, the more length you lose in the garment. So that's why things tend to ride up in the front, because you need a little more length. So that allows us to fit these two pieces back together proportionally the way they were before. Now when you do this process, if you look up, if you look here at my my uh, finished illustration, you can see, look at how dramatically the size of the dart has shifted. So now we have a very large dart space, whereas we had a very small dart space before in this original um, design. So we've managed to create a much bigger body space inside of this little pattern, just with that little, um, that little one idea. And we're not physically sewing the dart, but the dart is in the seam. The right. fullness is shaped just by Absolutely. sewing that seam allowance. Absolutely, yeah. The pattern shape that we're working with can either be made as a top or a vest, and here shows the, the vest version without the, the sleeves unit and a nice graceful curve at the center front. The same kind of style that, but that both Diane and I are wearing, but you're not limited just to this one shape. Yeah, you, have, you want to look at the difference between the fitting lines and the design lines. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about now, this front edge, is the design line. So you really want to personalize that for the garment that you're constructing. Diane, you've used a recycled manila folder. Yes, recycle, <laughs> recycle. Um, you can see I've drawn on here the original line for the pattern piece. Here's that curve that you see on the garments that Nancy and I are wearing. Well, the garment, the fabric that I'm using, I really wanted to play with the surface design on the fabric. And I've got these great dragon fabrics here. And I wanted to really make sure that I kind of highlighted those. So I've taken paper and I've cut around those dragons. Now, these happen to be individual flaps, but you can do this on a, on a solid piece of fabric as well. But you can see this has allowed me an, uh, a mm -hmm. chance to see what the finished shape will actually be like. Once I get this done, then I'm going to be using the piece I cut away as well. And you can see I have the center front uh, marked on this. So I can actually lay that on my fabric and use that to cut out my piece by adding a seam mm -hmm. allowance to the, to the piece first. So, and, and it can be any shape. You could, you know, zigzag or sure. angles. And, and the outer lines are design lines, and Diane has been also folded this back like a lapel. Right, which is another great look mm -hmm. for this, so that the lining becomes part of the outside of the garment. So that adds a whole other possibility. 
We have curved shapes on this outer edge, but you're not limited to curves. You could have design shapes that were much more linear. And on this particular piece, we have um, this garment has gone to angles, and we have a uh, we have an image that that lets us take a look at at this particular garment, which has turned just into angles. So this whole thing, uh, the person who's working with this with these fabrics and her body type has changed the whole garment to angles. So you can see with that front pattern piece, what we did was we went from the curve to the angle in a really simple. Uh, way just using a yardstick and, and taking some of the curve out. And we've also repeated that in the way the edge details work. And notice the interesting combination of fabrics. In our first program of this series, we worked with fabric combinations and how to choose them. And certainly these patterns are not limited to one fabric. Oh, and it's so great to use the fabrics that you love in combination and to highlight, you know, and to look the best on different parts of your body. So it's like putting together a puzzle or a mm -hmm. mosaic. Now here's the basic pattern piece that we're working with, this outer curve. And I would like to show you another example of how Diane works with changing those outer design lines. Not the lines that are the seams that connect different patterns together, but the outer areas. This batik has some interesting shapes to it, and you're going to really utilize those shapes. Well, what I, what I love here is that the batik fabric is it's got so many interesting little mm -hmm. shapes in it. And if I really want to highlight that, I'm, I'm looking around the fabric and you can see I can use my cutout as a way of just really finding the perfect little piece to, sure. to put in that niche as a, as a design element. So once I decide what's going to be in the shape, and here I've actually gone outside the original curve for part of the design, so it's going to be an interesting shape. So you can color outside the lines. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. If I do this and I really move off grain, mm -hmm. I will cut a fusible knit interfacing on grain to put behind this so that I'm you know, stabilizing, stabilizing the piece. Mm -hmm. So once I lay down the pattern piece that I've taken out of that shape, then I can again go ahead and add the seam allowance, cut it out, and I'm on my way. And now I've personalized it so that it's more of a designer garment. Utilizing the great style of the fabric. Well, the collar is another interesting area that we can look at for this particular pattern or any pattern. Those outer edges of the collar can definitely be changed. And Diane has some suggestions of working with that collar. Well, the collar is just, there's just, it's, it's a great design. It's a, it's a very fun shape. I really encourage all of you to put a diagonal bias grain line on your pattern pieces for your collars because there's so many more possibilities and the fit is much nicer for most collars. What I've done here is we've got a couple things to show you, but I'm, I'm taking the seam allowances off. So what I have is now a paper copy of what the actual collar will be so that I can put it on myself or my mm -hmm. dress form and work with that. I want to show you a couple things here. Um, I want to show you a, a great detail which is um, shown on this piece right here where it looks like you've inset a really interesting mm -hmm. little strip and it's very tricky to do. That However, would be difficult. It, yes. Well, it's really <laughs> actually very easy. All it is is a bias strip, and you can see on this sample right here, that I have stitched further in than the 5-8 seam allowance. So I need to be further in on the collar piece and give myself the seam allowance plus that little bit that I'm going to have to show. So I put that piece on and I left this so that you can see it's going to stand up a little mm -hmm. bit. And when you press it, you're going to be able to press it down and what you need is just a little bit of that. So I've got the uh, lining piece slightly bigger. You can see here the lining underneath is a larger piece than the outside. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm stitching and flipping that first bias piece out to the edge. Then I just put my lining on and I want to trim away that underneath piece of the collar. So all I'm really doing here is I've got a piece of fabric that I've um, stitched and flipped to the edge. When you turn this, here's what makes it pop out and is really interesting. When you turn this, you want to have a little bit of the lining showing from the other side. And that's what makes this such a, such a great kind of magical detail. So without a lot of work, you put an inset into that collar. Right. But looks it, like it. It looks inset. like it, but it's just an add-on piece. Right. This is, these are just a few of the ways that you can add some extra detail, some extra vision to this particular pattern, whether it's changing the outer curve, the shape, working with the collar. I hope you'll give these ideas a try. Hi, I'm Diane Erickson, artist and designer. Congratulations, Nancy, on 20 years of sewing with Nancy. As you just saw, the peony jacket has many options, creative options. 
the simplest one is when pressing the lining of the collar or of the front front just to extend it a fourth of an inch beyond the edge for that full piping look. Give it a try. Here's a hint from Adira. Adding a layer of stabilizer to the top or bottom of a project is an important step, giving extra stability to the fabric. For most of my projects, I prefer Avalon by Madeira. This water-soluble stabilizer has double the strength of comparable stabilizers. I simply place the Avalon underneath the fabric, giving the fabric some general stability. If working with nap fabrics like fleece or corduroy, to keep the threads from embedding into the nap, place the Avalon on top and underneath the fabric. When finished, just simply tear away the majority of the stabilizer and spritz the rest away. Here's a hint from Pfaff. For the most accurate of top and edge stitching, use Pfaff's ability to change the needle positions. There are a total of 19 positions ranging from far left to far right, plus many more positions in between. I use the needle position option frequently when using the edge stitch foot. The stitching can be positioned just at your preference. I also use the needle position option when top stitching a zipper. I know you'll find many more uses. Here's a hint from Prim Dritz. Use the reverse action tweezers for a variety of creative projects. Squeeze the handles to separate the prongs. In the relaxed position, the tweezers are always tightly closed. Use the tweezers when doing paper piecing to remove bits of paper. Easily score the paper with the tip of the tweezers. Then pinch the paper and remove. Also use the specialty tweezers to remove threads, to hold beads in place, and also insert needles into your machine. I know you'll find many other uses for this unique notion. It's time for Creative Sewing. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy. Patterns with Vision is a topic for this series with artist Diane Erickson as my guest. Diane is the designer of the pattern called Dragonfly, plus many other patterns. Diane, what I'm really impressed with is your ability to, to be non-traditional about sewing. You know, anyone can break out of the one fabric per garment mode. And I'd like to give the viewers some guidelines on how to explore their creativity. And using the dragonfly pattern as a palette, we can start out making a vest or a top. We'll play with some fabric combinations and also be teaching some printing, some stenciling technique. It's a wonderful way to personalize the design. I'll start by showing you the sewing sequence, and then Diane will rejoin me explore the fabric printing process next on Sewing with Nancy. I'm going to start by giving you some of the construction details of this dragonfly vest. It got its name because it has kind of a unique side seam that kind of has graceful wings as perhaps a dragonfly may have. To sew the side seams is a very easy application. What I'm going to detail for you is creating the inserts, whether we're going to stencil the inserts, stamp them, or I'm going to piece them in this segment. We'll show you how that's accomplished as well as in set them into the vest. This looks difficult, it isn't. But beneath the inset, you'll see an additional little accent of a tab down the front. Also, a neckline band in the front and in the back. And there are different widths. You don't have to have them always the same. You can see this vest has lots of detail. So the inserts at the top, the section down the front, and these button inserts are what I'm going to show you. The great part about it is that this front piece of the vest of the dragonfly vest is stable. It's cut to size and we're just going to add or apply these additional elements. That's what makes it easier than it looks, much easier. On the vest front, you're going to mark about one inch from the edge and you can do this on other patterns using this technique. Adding a little strip down the front is easy after you've marked the front. Cut a strip that's let's say two and a half inches wide, meeting the cut edge to the mark and then stitch a fourth of an inch seam allowance from the edge. Then you just simply press to meet the front. I pressed and stitched this remaining side all the way down and you can see you added the placket without a lot of work. It's very simple. To add the same kind of trim around the neck edge, I've also marked this, the line, the edge, with a piece of chalk around the neckline of the front and the back and you're going to add the trim before sewing the shoulder seams together. It's going to be you're going to be using a bias strip because this has a curve, so you obviously need the bias edge, making certain that the fabric has a lot of give. According to the pattern size, you're going to be cutting the width, 
and then meeting the cut edges to that mark right on the fabric, meeting right sides together. I'm going to slightly stretch this as I'm sewing, just giving it a little tug, allowing the bias to work with me. Sew about a half of an inch stretch. Sew, stretch, and then meet that cut edge to the edge marked on the fabric, or the chalk mark, I should say. So there isn't a pattern for this. It's as you are sewing, you are stretching it. As I'm bringing this up, I'm going to finger press it to show you how that shapes around the neckline, giving you that trim. Before I do the next step, I'm just going to press this. And the pressing will help ease some of that extra fabric into place. Now, if you have sewn so it isn't exactly even, all you have to do is trim from the underside or the top side following, if you can see my initial edge, I didn't sew just exactly straight, so I'll just trim off the excess, and no one will be the wiser. And this is why I like Diane's design so, because she has this unique method of construction that doesn't allow you to make any mistakes, just creative embellishments. Now, after you've added the bias trim of various widths, you can choose the width, by the way, I'm going to now detail working with the insets down the front that work kind of as buttonholes. You're given guidelines of either having a small, medium, or large inset. And this, on this particular jacket that I'm, or vest that I'm wearing, I've chosen to use the small inset. But you can place the different sizes on your pattern just to get a feel of what size and proportion you'd like to work with. Now you can make the inset out of a solid fabric, or you could do some creative piecing the way the sample that um, I'm working with, as well as the vest that I'm wearing, has this as the insert. Using your pattern piece for the small insert, cut a woven fabric, a tightly woven fabric, as a base. Then on that base, place just a scrap in the center, somewhat rectangular, little, uh, doesn't have to be exactly point on point, just place it in the middle. Then after placing that in the center, Find some coordinate fabrics and place the coordinate fabric along one of the edges of that center piece. And with a narrow fourth of an inch seam allowance, simply stitch along this edge. For those of you who are quilting enthusiasts, this is a very common crazy patchwork technique. Then I'm simply going to cut along the edge. Then I would finger press this piece forward. Now notice that it is going beyond the edge. I'll just straighten that out a little bit later. But right now, I would just find another piece, align it, stitch, and flip. So using the stitch and flip technique, I would simply just create my square and square it up afterwards. Now you may be wondering, how are you going to put that square inset into the jacket front? And this is where I'm really pleased to show you this idea because it works so well. On your pattern itself, you're going to mark the V inserts. And I have them marked with chalk, just slightly in this area. And then placing the insert that you have just sewn, place it on the garment, matching a fourth of an inch mark to that very point. Now I'm just going to highlight this so you can see where my point is. And then I'm going to put a point also, use your pins to help you, a point on the right the wrong side of the inset, matching point on point. And I'm going to stack those two points together and pin. My first row stitching is going to be from the point outward. And trying to start exactly at that area will be the critical step. And that's not really very difficult to do. Take a little time, stitch in place a couple of stitches, and then stitch with a fourth of an inch seam following, there's a chalk mark on my line, I'm just going to follow that down. After cutting this, I'm simply going to do some cutting. After cutting the threads, I should say, I'll, I'll do cutting of the jacket or the vest. Cut forward toward the point, and I'm going to lift up my little seam and cut as accurately as possible to my stitching, not cutting through the stitching. When I flip this down, you will see that the insert now has phase one stitched. To stitch phase two, I'm simply going to 
fold the, the vest out of the way. And before doing another little sewing, I'm going to trim off the excess seam allowance in that area. So I just have a fourth of an inch remaining. And then align the cut edge with the insert. And then do another row of stitching. Stitching, this time I'm going to stitch to the point. It's up to you how you prefer to do this stitching. But it is amazing how by taking it step by step, not having a section cut out of your vest, and let me get rid of that thread, which is that doesn't need to be there, get it out of the way, and you'll see that I have it inset. It's a nicely inset with just two rows of stitching. You're going to be cutting the lining to fit this and sew the vest fronts together, and now we'll show you other creative detail. You just saw how fun it was to create this dragonfly vest, and I showed you how to work with the insets and make, create these great button areas. But now you can see a lot of great detail on this vest. And Diane, your fabric did not have these coffee motifs printed on the fabric. You did that yourself. That's one of the stencils, and this is what the little stencil looks like. I really am excited to show your viewers the stenciling because it's so quick and easy and such a great way to personalize your fabric. Diane's been stenciling, she told me, for 25 years. So this is a real master to show you this. Um, this is. Uh, the stencils have so much unlimited possibility, so much potential for interesting things that you can do to personalize your, your uh, garments and your fabric pieces. I wanted to show you a stencil, and then I wanted to show you three different things that came from that stencil because it really doesn't matter what the design is. You can print totally unique designs with, with using the same stencil as the person next to you. Um, I took one that's this floral uh, stencil with the calla lily leaves and flowers because I think it only appeals to maybe people who are sort of into floral and leaf kind of shapes. And this first uh, presentation might be the way you would picture it, which mm -hmm. would be sort of a bouquet kind of sure. a format. Well, that's all of the images on here were printed with that same stencil. However, when you look at this second piece of fabric, everything on there was also printed from that same stencil. And you can see what's changing here is I'm only using bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. I'm not using the entire design every time I print. So I've got, you know, tips of leaves or sure. bits of stems, et cetera, and I've used that great little shape as a border. Um, and I'm really just using the stencil um, uniquely and, and, and just bits and pieces. I've got another piece of fabric underneath here, which lets you see a totally different use of that same stencil. This is the calla lily stencil. Can you believe that? No, you'd never know that. All I've done is put strips of paper down, and I've taken the entire sheet laid it down and printed it, moved it slightly, and then printed a second color, and then picked it up and peeled my paper off. The paper so goes on the fabric. The paper goes on the fabric, and then I print, you know, pulled that off. So those three pieces of fabric have come from that same stencil design. It's amazing to me, all the, all the possibilities of the, of the stencils. Here's a small piece where um, I've taken masking tape, and I put masking tape down onto the striped areas of the fabric, and then I've done the printing and then peeled up the masking tape. So what you're looking at is a leaf sort of floating underneath the stripes, which is kind of a fun effect. I'm always looking for ways to make the stenciling look like it was there, like it belongs there, and not just something, you know, stuck on the surface. The jacket that you have here at the top of the dragonfly, you stenciled this after you cut the fabric, a little rectangle, a little bit larger than the pattern piece. Right. Right, and so I've, I've started with the, the pieces. I've done some rubber stamping and some stenciling on the surface of this one. And you can see it's a great canvas for really just playing with surface design. You've got these wonderful little uh, bands on the sleeves, which give you another place to do mm -hmm. uh, some, some printing. And I've got a board here that I brought some interesting examples of lots of different printing that, that I've been doing. And you can see how unique it can look on different kinds of fabrics, textured fabrics. Uh, the iridescent paints give a different effect and I'm just using a piece of sponge to print with so we'll, we'll be doing that in a few minutes. I've even stenciled my covered buttons. You can stencil the fabric beforehand and then make the covered buttons so maybe that's something you're going to want to do on your dragonfly a garment. And here's a repetition of a very simple design. Just Absolutely a, oh. just that little uh, series of squares can make a really great Dine design. I'll show you how to how to blend colors Gray together. The colors, yeah. This is a chiffon piece that has been stenciled and when D Diane placed it over another piece of fabric, you can see it gives it an iridescent look. Even if I would place it on this yellow, you could see that's kind of an interesting... Yeah, or a stripe or another print. Um, all kinds of possibilities can come from that. 
We have some all over prints. This is an alphabet, believe it or not, just reprinted and printed. Printed one way, printed another way. You never know yeah. it's an alphabet. You never know what's going to make a great surface and design. All over bamboo. And then down below, we have a borders, which are more detailed than the all over prints. But the, the really great thing about the stenciling is that on all these pieces of fabric that you see here, these all started out as solid colors. And this is really a personal statement. Sure. This is a way of saying, you know, this is my designer piece and this is my signature in the way that I, I do my surface design. You know, stenciling really allows fabrics to work together. And what we have here are some of the designs that you are going to, I don't know if I'm going the right sequence, but yeah. this yeah. will work. Let me, let me show you a, a couple of things here. Um, the stenciling can also be used just for binding. And I wanted to show you this because it's <laughs> such a great sample. Right. And it's not the design that you're working with, it's what you do with the design that, that creates the look. And I brought this one specifically because you would be very surprised to find out that that great surface texture was created by a stencil that's actually this Cricut. It's a very specific thing. But you can see when I print it all over and then I just use it as a small piece of binding, mm -hmm. how unique that piece starts to look and it doesn't look anything like the Cricut. So if you've got um, stencils at home now, you want to start using them in a slightly different way because you get a lot more possibility out of them. I've, here's, a, here's a piece of fabric that I was printing on um, earlier. And I wanted to show this because sometimes you don't exactly like what you get. Mm -hmm. And this might not be the most interesting look. However, if I fold that and show you what it would look like as a piece of piping, adding that pink color really is a nice accent yes. to, the, to the black. So sometimes you just need, need to use a smaller amount of what you've printed with, and it really does work really well. Here's a piece that I've just started printing on. Here's a dragonfly that I've, that I've started printing on, and I have... Uh, I've cut out windows for each of the three sizes of the insets that you get in the pattern. So this really helps me design because I can look at this and say, okay, do I want one inset in the middle? Mm -hmm. um, do I want maybe um, a large one and a small one? Or do I want three small ones? I can play with the size and the scale and proportion on my body for the insets and where they're going to go. So it's a really great way to, to figure that out. Once I do that, and you can see I've done some printing here. I've done extra printing on this piece of fabric. And what I can do is I can take the window for the size uh, inset I'm going to use and I can actually go around on my scrap piece and find the really cool design that I want to have in my inset. So it's, a, it's just a really great way to, to be using this to uh, help design the front of the, the piece. How about if we do the stenciling because you've inspired us with all these ideas and how do we actually do this? Let me show you how you do this. This is so quick and easy. And here's a combination of fabrics that we're thinking about to go with this mm -hmm. for, our, for our dragonfly. Let me show you a little printing here. What I've got are several colors. I'm going to be using a piece of dense foam and I'm going to be wadding it up so I have a nice little firm piece to print with. And we're going to have to keep turning this, aren't we? <laughs> because we're in an angle. Yeah. Yeah, so you want to touch into the paint, then you work, work it around a little bit. That's a secret because if you just go to the paint and then go to your stencil, you sure. get a big blob. So you don't want that. So you want a very small amount. Then what you're going to do is you're just going to lightly brush over the top. You can pound it. You can do um, to get different mm -hmm. kinds of textures. You can use parts of the stencil. So I might just use a small bit of that little ladder stencil here and there. Can you believe how easy this is? Look at this. And the secret is that I don't have a lot of paint on there. That's definitely part of the secret, because I can go like this, mm -hmm. and you'll see that it's really not coming off. I want a small amount. I can add a different color in, even if you don't feel confident about mixing colors. Let the colors mix themselves. So as I work here, I can dab that, you know, that second color in so that I can be adding you know, and, and working with the paints in different ways. So the stenciling is very easy, very quick, and something that you're really going to want to play with. And just brush it on. Don't just brush use it right a lot on. of paint. Just brush it right on. Just really easy. So you can see when working with stencils that you can change the personality of your fabric. You can blend fabrics together to make them look like they're to go together. Absolutely. And be very sporadic as far as your design, very planned. It really doesn't matter, but play with your fabric. And some fabric paints, some sponges. This is just a sponge that has a one just inch. Just a piece of dense foam. So you don't really have to have anything special, just some textile paints and play to your heart's content. Diane, this has been an inspiring part of this program. Any fabric could work with stenciling. And thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Sandra Betsina. Nancy, I just wanted to tell you how proud I am. 20 years of sewing and serving the American public. Amazing. You've done a great job. It's time to wrap up our three-part series on patterns with vision. Diane, I've thoroughly enjoyed this process of working with you and being inspired. I really enjoyed sharing my creative ideas with you and your viewers. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now. Visit Nancy's website at www.sewingwithnancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy has been made possible by grants from the following companies. Pfaff, simply the best European line of sewing machines. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears. Madeira Threads, because creativity is never black and white. Prim Drifts, the source for sewing and quilting notions. Amazing Designs by Great Notions, your one source for home embroidery and design software. Koala Cabinets, designed with maximum storage using minimum space. Rowenta, professional performance and beautiful results for all types of ironing. And Nancy's Notions Sewing Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and notions.